yeah, so honored to have you, Mo Ibrahim, as a keynote speaker and guest today at the APF. You have been such a great proponent for all the great things concerning our continent. And the reality is, this is a critical period in our history as Africans. The APF theme this year is focused on driving a decade of change. And it's rooted in the APF vision, which is to transform the culture of giving on the continent to the extent that it exceeds development aid by 2030. This requires action at the individual level, at the local level, and at the collective. And there's no better person to talk about philanthropy on the continent and the role of Africans doing it themselves than you. So we're honored that you've taken the time to join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, that's a uh, very kind of you. You make me blush, actually. And I'm, I'm glad we are, uh, I'm hiding behind my screen here. Uh, well, thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, Yes, it is uh, interesting times, and uh, not only in Africa, it's everywhere. And I think uh, uh, there's going to be uh, great momentum for change uh, following this uh, pandemic and the, uh, the aftermath. I think I think things will not be the same. We 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 we, uh, we have to watch that space. Definitely, definitely. Now, you alluded to COVID-19, and it's had severe implications for Africans. Granted, our continent has defied all projections when it comes to the number of cases and the number of deaths. And Africans have risen as a collective to address the challenges of this pandemic. However, we've also seen the economic downturns, the devaluation in many of our countries, the economic crisis that has emerged. I work in agriculture. There have been lots of implications. It's also exposed the fragility and the weak systems. How can we move from the current state of paralysis and take advantage of the situation to shape the Africa we want? There's this mindset around building back better. What do you think is needed to ensure that that really happens on the continent? I mean, let me, let me start by, by really uh, saluting the leadership shown uh, by many African leaders, uh, which surprised actually a lot uh, of people, uh, including myself, actually. Uh, we have seen much better response than many uh, Western countries, actually. And uh, uh, people scrambled uh, to really deal with the pandemic. Uh, Africa has been stung before uh, with Ebola and other pandemic, and people knew uh, uh, what they need to do to take things seriously uh, from the outset. Uh, so that was really wonderful, and most of our leaders uh, have shown really a uh, 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 great initiative, and that's great. That we have been campaigning for for the last 15 years. You know, we want to show real leadership in Africa, and uh, I hope. Uh, this continuous going on the future is not only uh, uh, something dictated by, 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 by a crisis. Now, if we come to the pandemic itself, uh, I must admit uh, that I am surprised, and many people are surprised, uh, how benign it has been in Africa. At, you know, the, the health question. Uh, for some reason, the, 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 the virus doesn't seem to like Africans. Mm -hmm. And we do welcome that. Uh, a lot of explanations, but none of them really uh, give convincing answer, complete answer to what happened. So we're lucky in that sense. But the worry is uh, the, the, the economic mm -hmm. effect of the pandemic actually is much worse for us than the health effect. Uh, we have like, I mean, we lost maybe between 35 and 40,000 lives in, in Africa, 1.3 billion people. Uh, don't forget we lose close to 400,000 people every year to malaria. I don't know if people know these statistics or not. Mm -hmm. So it's just given as an idea. 
400,000 people die of malaria every year, and the world is, 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 is not paying much attention to that, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, the economic effect on us has been, has been quite devastating. Uh, uh, trade, international trade almost froze, uh, and, and, and our fragile economics, we don't have actually the fiscal space to deal with 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 with, with a pandemic of that magnitude. You cannot ask people to sit at home and you don't give them money. You don't pay them. Because people go out to earn day by day living. And uh, uh, you know, you stay at home, what are you gonna do? I mean it, it is a problem. Uh, in richer society of course governments made very generous uh, relatively uh, 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 allowances uh, for 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 its workers, and uh, uh, there is, uh, of course, the internet was very important. Uh, kids, was, most of kids anyway, were still able to get some education. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that infrastructure in Africa. And uh, if you have four or five kids and you have a very weak internet, you can imagine the fighting over their time there or uh, stuff. Anyway, uh, so what what shall we do going forward? I mean, we we have not received much assistance. At the beginning, uh, there was wonderful calls. Uh, I remember the call for action by nine European leaders uh, who signed the letter together with, with some twin African leaders. and. Uh, stated that we can only defeat this uh, when we defeat it in Africa. Only victory in Africa uh, will really uh, uh, end this. And uh, the call for $100 billion of immediate support to Africa, very little has materialized, unfortunately, with the exception of the IMF under the wonderful leadership of uh, Kristalina, uh, who really, uh, uh, a very good person and a good leader. Uh, she able to do some, something which is good. She tried to do more. I hope she can. But I didn't see much uh, support link, uh, coming out. Uh, people estimate that some $13 trillion have been printed out, borrowed, whatever, in the developed uh, countries in various kinds of support to business and, and and, and, and people, uh, how much in Africa? Very, very little. Uh, so that's really unfortunate. Uh, we'll have to large extent to depend on ourselves in getting up of this, nothing of ourselves and getting up and going forward. Uh, some friends may help, fair enough. Uh, now, I think they have a number of opportunities here uh, this pandemic is going to focus our mind on a number of crucial issues. Number one is the importance of the public health service. This is vital for all of us. And not only in Africa, everywhere. I was, I was just amazed and bewildered watching on my, I was in UK uh, during the lockdown, the severe lockdown of, uh, of the spring. And uh, everybody, including the prime minister, the MPs, the people who go out in the streets at seven o'clock to upload the health workers mm -hmm. who are dying like flies because you mm -hmm. don't have protective kids. If you don't, mm -hmm. So every night you go out to upload them. It is the same health workers who for three years did not get any pay rises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lowest paid people in the country. And now go out to upload, upload those heroes. You see the hypocrisy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, embedded in our system of governance here. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really important for us to pay attention to the public health system essential for our survival during this time. That's really important. Then we need to look at the food security. Mm -hmm. Because there was moments where 
we were thinking, well, uh, we're going to have a problem here. Uh, Africa imports a lot of food, unfortunately. We have the greatest you know, fertile land in the world. So we have the most arable, uncultivated land than anybody else. And uh, half our people almost involved in the rural sector in agriculture. And yet we're importing a lot of food every year. And with the disruption of supply lines, what's happening? I'm going to start or what? And what about inter-Africa trade? Mm -hmm. Trading among ourselves. You know, it's, it used to be 11% of our trade. Now it is into 17, 18%. A lot need to be, we need to trade with ourselves. We you need to trade between ourselves. And that's important. That's one of the uh, trade agreements uh, uh, which are signed. This is very important, and we hope it matters. We're here, we need to see leadership. Come on, guys, we need to see leadership here. And we need to move very quickly there. Food security is going to be important in, 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 in this sort of It's important all the time, anyway. Uh, another uh, area is important now. I think that give us a chance also to think of building green. We need to think about that. Uh, power generation, we need to build a lot of power. And we have a lot of sun, a lot of water. We, we can build green effectively. Uh, and actually, the cost of building green is coming down. Jobs are much more. We need to move a little bit from the mentality of relying on minerals and, and mining and mining doesn't offer much jobs and jobs is a real <laughs> problem for our kids you know we have millions of, of, of young people who are looking for work we need to see what kind of industries what kind of activity are going to generate this work so these are some of the things i can just think of off the cuff uh, we need to think of and do thank you so much that's a great list and I can assure you that many of those issues you've raised are going to be covered over the next two days at the APF. So you spot on. I think we picked the right topics. Now, secondly, um, you address this issue that we have to fill these gaps on our own. The financial burdens are not going to be lifted by any other country. The countries are dealing with their own issues. Africa has to sort this out. But we have a challenge more, which is that many of our philanthropists work in silos. Um, we saw the philanthropists coming out in a big way uh, with COVID relief efforts, but still working in silos. What can we do uh, to promote collaboration, to promote sharing, um, and to get more of our philanthropists to leave their egos and logos at the door and partner to address these critical challenges? No, I think I think that's uh, that's 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 a good point. Uh, let me start by saying, I think maybe one, one area we need to think about here is, is the concept of philanthropy itself. Because in Africa, we have this extended families. The family structure is different from that in the West. And uh, if a member of the family, this is very extended family, which can be hundreds and hundreds of people, if one of them does well and make some money, has a good job or came a business person and made some money. Uh, what they do usually is try to look after their extended family. Uh, the many cousins and cousins of cousins and wives of cousins and children. And it is, and in their mind is that they're doing good, which is wonderful, you know, because that, that is producing some some kind of informal safety net in our society. We don't have safety nets. We don't have social safety nets in our countries. So that's the informal safety net. It's the extended family, and that is also uh, looks like philanthropy because you know in, in some way is giving, uh, although. A Western de definition of philanthropy will be that uh, to give 
to somebody you don't know and you may never meet in your life. You give in for people in need, whatever you can give, uh, with the material, with the spiritual, with the support, whatever, it's trying to help people who are missing out. Uh, our concept of France to build Africa in general is different, is looking after the clan, looking after the tribe, looking after the village, the, the family. And uh, uh, here we need to somehow, uh, it is wonderful what we do, our people are doing, but also we need to extend that a little bit to care for population at large, for all of humanity. And that would be uh, wonderful. So we have not made completely uh, that move yet. At, at how we define philanthropy and how we do philanthropy uh, in Africa. Uh, that's why we have not seen the emergence of many philanthropic foundations uh, like we see in the West or, you know, where thousands and thousands of this foundation because there's no extended family to give to anyway. So we have to give to some other people. Uh, it's a different uh, 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 concept of family. Uh, that's why we are very few. There are very few of us in Africa who build foundations to really get engaged in society at large. So that one issue we have. There's not many, not many of us. Then uh, we have not also had the we did not have accumulated the assets. Capitalists have managed to accumulate over a year of industrial developments in, in the West. So the amount of money available is not that large because there are very few successful African business people who managed to make it. I mean, we all came from poor backgrounds and, and somehow some of us managed to do something but there's not, unfortunately, many, uh, uh, many of us. Have. Many of the business in Africa is in foreign ownership, actually. It's not in our hands. We have not done it. So other people do it. Uh, that also weakened the base of the philanthropic class, let us say, which comes from the... Uh, so we have some challenges. Then I come to your point, which is a very valid point, and it's something which I have been arguing for for, for a long, long time. We cannot do anything if you operate in silos. We need to leverage each other. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, you know? Uh, so we need to have, and we don't need to have our name over every project or over every, you know? We need a little bit to depersonalize what we're doing. It is, it is, it's not like a badge of honor we want to do it. Unfortunately, it's not only philanthropists. I mean, all the world, uh, you know, organization have the same problem. You know, the Dutch or the German or the British or the French, they all compete and they all have this little bit uh, projects. And uh, so we always call for really cooperation and uh, people adopt what's best in class and find then you lead in this area because you build the expertise and we support you. Uh, I am this you support me. I think that is really important for us uh, to work uh, to work together. And I found actually one thing, my personal experience was extremely helpful is that uh, I'm fortunate I had many friends and uh, I was invited to many boards on, in, in some important foundations or we built strategic alliances with some foundations. So we're able to bring these people together in one room, which was really effective. And some of the meeting I had in New York, was, it was amazing. Uh, some great foundations who never talk to each other. And then when I come from Africa to bring these two guys, a few guys together to say, hey, you're doing the same thing. Maybe we should really uh, work together. Uh, so yeah, that's a very important. 
I hope you encourage your membership that uh, uh, really to, to box is smart, huh? be smart. And there is a multiplier effect of work and working together. And uh, let us shed our egos and uh, our individualism and say, hey, we can all work together and we can all own this together. I mean, it's not an ownership. It is, it is how to be effective and how to deliver. Thank you so much. I completely agree with you. And that's one of the key objectives of the APF. Um, and you've spoken our language. We can do much more if we work together. Yeah. So my last question, um, I know you're passionate about youth. I share that passion. I think youth are Africa's greatest asset. Absolutely. Um, and as you know, this last few weeks has been really tough all over Africa and in a, a few particular countries, um, Nigeria, Mali, Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire. You know, there, there's quite a bit of apprehension. And young people have shown us such resilience um, and creativity and yet they're losing hope. So why are you still hopeful about Africa's future and what message do you have for our young people, especially our young philanthropists? I think, I think youth really is the future of Africa. And we have to accept that this young generation is far better than our generation. It's much more equipped with the tools to really uh, work in this environment than us. There, when I was their age, I didn't have the amount of information they had. I didn't have access to all these social media. And, and, and you know, you, 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 you. I always used to say, when I was a young man in Sudan, I mean, we have only two newspapers, one run by the government, one run by, 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 by the army. That's it. Uh, you know, you, you, TV channel, there's one TV channel which is just, keep telling you what the president ate in the morning, what you meet in the afternoon, and our sources of information. There is a ministry in every, in every African country. At that time, it was called Ministry of Information. This runs the broadcasting, uh, the newspapers, the uh, news agency. This is a government thing, and uh, it is the government job to control your information. Okay, through the schools, through the, through the radios, through the, etc., and uh, so the nationalized information, and uh, this is not the situation now, and so our young people now are much better informed, much better connected uh, than ourselves, with much with far better skills, and uh, and there is a lot of them. There is a lot of them. The majority of people in Africa are young people. And I always say, look, I mean, you are the greatest space. Why don't you take power? You know, just organize yourself, go and take power because you need to run the country. Uh, those old guys running our countries will not be there in that future. They are determining it now. The guy who runs the country today is deciding the future of this country for the next 10, 20 years through his policies and decisions. They will not live to see what's happening there. It's not, they're not interested in that. That's why we see many leaders don't care about climate change. They're short-sighted because they're gonna, not gonna be there when it happens. And uh, they don't think about, oh, but what about my children? What about my grandchildren? They didn't have even the far side to think about that. So those are really a valuable asset for us. But to, unfortunately, we are letting those guys down. You start looking at our system of education. That need complete overhaul. This education system we have is, is a throwback from the colonial system, which required certain profile and educated people to run bureaucratic jobs in some administration, you know. No. When last time our educators sat with business people and said, oh, by the way, what, what kind of skills you need? Where the job's gonna come from? What I need to teach my kids? We need to, 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 what the skills needed now to get a job is different from the skills needed 30 or 40 years ago. And we need to adjust our education system to do that. We also need to develop more of this technical school, the German type of technical schools, because we need people 
who can build power lines, build dams, build railways, build ships, build aeroplanes, do agriculture, and all these are technical jobs. Who is training those guys? It's not acceptable that Chinese come to build the railway and just bring the workers. They put a factory, go and bring their workers. Excuse me. What about our kids? Oh, they don't have the skills. No, they should have the skills and it's our responsibility to build the children's school. That also requires a change in our uh, uh, social behavior because we very much respect uh, white colors, you, you know, uh, university graduates, people like you and me. Uh, we think, oh, that's great. And we disrespect people blue collar, you know, a technician. A technician is a very important person. Those, those are the heroes, and we need to change that. You know, uh, you ask somebody, why are you going to university? You're not, we're not going to a technical school. You know, when you go to university, most of the people go to university don't find jobs because we produce so many law degrees and art degrees, and, and there's no jobs. We, we have just too, too many graduates of arts, and that's wonderful as a culture, but job-wise, it doesn't help to get a job. We need more engineers, we need more doctors, more technicians, more, you know, and agronomists. We need, we, need, we need this kind of skills. And we need to change our also social concept. You ask a young guy, why are you not going to go and say, oh, because I want to get married. When I go and marry a beautiful girl, they will ask me, have you been to university? If I say no, they reject me, you know, I'm, it's not respected. We need to change that in our mind. The guy who is coming from technical school will find a job, will put bread on the table, and that is important. Uh, so there's a lot of changes we need uh, to do in order to really, uh, this is a huge workforce which need to be energized, who need to be brought to the marketplace. We can only do that if we focus on giving them the skill the need. And I just have a feeling this will not happen unless more of our young people get into government, get into power, get into, and you look at the age of our leaders across Africa. This is a joke. Why is that? You know, yeah, many young people all over the world are in, you know, position of power. 40 years old, 45 years, running huge countries, bigger countries than our countries. And we only uh, uh, love to elect geriatrics. Why? I don't know. We need to change also that. And I need to see more of our young people in leadership position. Thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation. I, I always love talking with you more because you're honest and you always have a call to action. And I am energized, and I'm sure everyone at the APF today is energized by your call to action. We need to change our mindsets. We need to get involved in governance. We need to transform our ecosystems, the food, health, education, and we need to empower each other and collaborate to create the Africa we so deserve. The next 10 years, we can achieve the SDGs if we work together collaboratively. Thank you for those messages. Thank you for your time, and thank you for your passion. God bless you. And have a wonderful day. <laughs> Take care.